And we are live. Good morning. Good morning. Greetings. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Come on in. Good morning. Good morning. We're live. Come on in. Come on in. Let me know where you're coming from. Come on in. We are here. We are live. Demetrius Scott's in the building. Maurice Foster is in the building. Stephanie Gooden is in the building. Greetings, greetings. Janine Wilkins is in the building from Alaska. She got up early this morning because she's taking advantage of the academy. Bernice Lewis is here. Eddie Ford is here. Kelly Cowell is here. Angie, uh, where is it? It went that quick. Kimberly Wilson Daniel is in the building. Michael Benton is here. Ray, uh, Raquel, oh man, this thing is going fast. Squall is here. Golfar, WT is here. Kendall Dorsey is here. Jenny Hernandez is in the building. My man Leviticus Pointer from Memphis, Tennessee is in the building. Good to see you, sir. Renee Henry is in the building. Janae Glover Smalls is here. Cohen Ten is here. Irvin Made is here. I think that's one of my former students. Irving, what's going on, sir? It's been many years. Good to see you. Gail Ramirez is in the building. Lily Lanier, Miss Catching Ringo, Angela, Tiana Borchard is in the building. Kevin Jack, Dr. Greg Baker's in the building. Come on in, folks. Let them know. You know, I'm doing the finale of this Black History Month series that I started back on the first Saturday of Black History Month, and we took it all the way to the end. Principal Dot McKeever Jeter is in the building. Wyatt Jones is in the building. Jesse Green is in the building. Carla Lee J is in the building. We got we got John, oh man, that's a hard one to pronounce and it went so quickly. Uh, Highs Whitehurst is in the building. Kimberly Broughton Cafele, the wife, is in the building. We got teacher Sandra 73 in the building. Vern, uh, Ver Verlin John is in the building. KB checking in in the building. We got the fam. Chanel Henry Wright is in the building. We got Sean Hurt in the building. Let me, I keep forget Sean Hurt. You check him out at seven o'clock tomorrow night. Sean Hurt, the school turnaround principal, will be on live seven. He does it every week. He got something else coming today, but I ain't going to plug that one because, you know, I'm all right now. <laughs> I can't do that one, Sean. <laughs> Marcus Mars is in the building, but y'all check Sean tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Pamela Toller, Chris Well is in the building. Kimberly George is here. Rodney Richardson is in the building. My man, Joe Truss out there on the west coast is in the building good to see you sir uh stephanie jacobs karen fletcher and rhodes cammy berry is in the building we got about a minute let's go hit that share button man let them know hit that retweet button we're on two platforms on facebook hit the share button on both we on twitter hit the share button we on youtube hit the share button let them know chandra kai uh, uh kai wise is in the building esmeralda cabrera is in the building mark croxton is in the building man we got the folks in the building hit that share button see some people they like Man, he does the shout outs at 1055. Then he does the announcements and the motivational message and 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 the, and the word of the day. I check him out around 11, 10, 11, 15. Now, now you got to get all this energy. But look here, y'all. We got a lot to talk about. It's 11 o'clock. So with that being said, good morning. Greetings. Welcome to the 44th edition of the Virtual Assistant Principal Leadership Academy. And as I always say for 44 consecutive weeks now, I don't know about you. I don't know, but I, I think I know, but I'm not sure, but I'll find out. But if I could speak for me, let me let you know how I feel. I'm on fire. 
Y'all ain't hear me. You ain't you 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 didn't hear me. I, I whispered that one. It was too low. You you didn't catch that. Let me let me give it to you one more time. I'm on fire. Why why is this man shouting every Sunday, every every Saturday morning that he's on fire, Lori J? Why why every Saturday morning does he shout out that he's on fire? Because I gotta remind you that you chose leadership. You chose leadership. You chose to lead, not just to teach, but you chose to lead. How are you going to lead and you don't have fire and energy and excitement and enthusiasm and passion in your leadership? You explain it to me because I don't know. I don't know how anybody could lead it. I don't mean charismatic leadership, but I just mean that feeling inside your soul. Right. That 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 thing that's churning inside that says, man, I can't wait to get started today because I'm taking these young people to heights previously unimagined. See, that's what I mean by I'm on fire. I told you all last week, y'all got to remind me when I get hyped when I start out, because two weeks ago, remember, I lost my voice. Right. But I'm, I feel good. Listen, y'all. I, I, I got to give you that motivational message right quick because I got a lot to cover today. But but, you know, I've been using this protecting word as my as my prefix for the past few months now. So here I'm saying protecting your vision. Right. Protecting your vision. Here's what I'm saying. I'm willing to bet everything I own, which ain't much, but everything I own. That not one of you entered this profession without a vision. You had a vision, or said said probably better. You have a vision, right? So you you didn't like enter the field of education with no vision. You knew what you wanted. You knew what you wanted to accomplish. You saw that before you took the first step. Vision. So I'm saying to you, as I said, with all these these elements that I said, you got to protect. Well, you got to protect your vision because your vision could be that your school will be one of the highest performing schools in the country within the next three years. And then you got people right on the same staff in your building. You got people close to you. You got people in the community who are coming into you saying, well, uh, that's not really realistic. You know, you, you setting yourself up for failure. You're setting your school up for failure. You're setting yourself up for disappointment and heartache, right? And stress and so forth. So now, so now you take your vision because you've been impacted by, by their comments, by their negativity. And now next thing you know, you say, well, we'll, we'll make like a, a five or 10 percentage point gain. We're not going for the, the grand slam anymore. We, 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 if we could get five or 10 points, percentage increase on state standardized tests, then we've done something because we, we've done something that hasn't been done in a long time. But your but your big picture vision, you said you're going to be at the top. You said you're going to be world champion. You said you're going to be one of the highest performing, but you didn't protect, you didn't guard, you didn't shield the vision. And next thing you know, the vision is gone. See, I'm saying, I'm saying to you, you got to protect that bad boy. Right. You got you got to shield that bad boy. Right. Because somebody can come into your space. Somebody can come into your circle. Somebody can come into your life. And it doesn't even have to be someone someone close. It could be an adversary. Right. Be whatever. But now you've allowed them to extinguish, to douse your vision. You maintain that vision. You keep that vision. Let me give you this word of the week real quick. I say word of the week slash word of the day, right? My word of the day is history. Once again, history. And here's what I'm saying. You know, when, when, I, when I did the first session, in, in, the first Saturday in February, dealing with African-American history, I kind of was thinking I was just going to do the one Saturday. And then I spilled over into a second. And then I thought I was going to end it there and get back to this. And then I said, man, you know, all week, like this, this, this academy's really been on my mind more than normal this month. And I said, I, I can't stop here. I gotta, I gotta keep dropping this information because there are leaders out here 
educators out here, you know, whatever your capacity, because I know we're not just APs on the broadcast. We got superintendents, board members watch. Uh, we, we got everybody. We got people who are not in education who watch. So we, we, we got a little bit of everybody on here. So I said, I want to make sure that I cover at least 50 areas of, of, of history that, that a leader should know particularly if you have at least one black child in the school. So my word of the day is history. And I'm saying as a leader, not as not, you don't have to be a historian, but you do have to be grounded in some history. You do have to understand history because you're not going to fully know your, your student body. If you don't have a sense of history, who they are. Right. So with that said, and I'm, you know, I look at the comments as they come in. I try anyway. Sometimes I get so focused that, that I don't see them, but I'll say this to you. I read them all. My wife could tell you, I sit here, I, I literally sit here for about two or three hours every Saturday doing nothing but going through these comments. That's what I do. Because remember, we're on four platforms. So I got four platforms worth of comments. So again, let me, let me, let me, let me say to you, hit that share button, hit the retweet, and let me get to these quick announcements. For anybody that's on here who's new, and every week we got new people. I want you to understand that there's an overarching question that drives everything about this academy. And that overarching question is, does my assistant principalship benefit my school academically? Right. The reason I started this academy back in May 2nd, 2020, 44 weeks ago, was because it, it's, it's my firm belief that the assistant principalship is the most misunderstood and underutilized position in all of education. So I vowed to make a dent in, 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 in the assistant principalship through writing this book, The Assistant Principal 50, which I encourage all of you to own if you don't own it already. And through this book, The Aspiring Principal 50, right? So the two books, I said, I vowed to make an impact worldwide, most particularly nationally on the way that assistant principals are being utilized. I'm, I'm, you know, when, when this virus is over, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be getting into these universities. I'm also setting up regional academies across the country where you'll earn a certificate for being a part of it. So that's after that's when we can get out here in the world. Virus ain't never going nowhere, but until we can at least be safe out here, I'm, I'm going, you know, the, what this is just a smattering of what I'm going to be doing. I'm going full throttle on on this assistant principalship in terms in terms of looking at it differently, approaching it differently and utilizing assistant principals radically differently. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. So I showed you the book. Subscribe to the Virtual AP Leadership Academy uh, on YouTube. So all the previous videos, the previous 43, they're there. This one is re being recorded live right now, and it'll be there forever until I, un unless I one day take it down. And then subscribe. Also like and follow my Virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page. Right. So that's that because I write in a, I write a, 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 a blog post slash commentary every Sunday. So you don't want to miss those. They're follow up to this, but just a little something extra beyond this. Do I have it all? Uh, next week, got to tell you about next week real quick because some of y'all don't stay the whole time. You got other things you got to do, I understand. But uh, next week I'm doing, you know, I have this on video already, but I recorded it in 2017. I'm giving an update and I'm giving it a title, Preparation for the Principal Interview. Let's break it down. That's next Saturday. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to stay on as long as I got to stay on. I'm not going to break that one up. It's going to be one video preparation for the principal interview. Let's break it down. The ones that are already there, they're great. Uh, thousands of people are working in administration because they watch those videos. So I'm not going to, you know, they're there, but I need a 2021 version. So let's go, y'all. I'm ready. What time is it? I spent 10 minutes, right? So now we go. My topic today, part three of three. What do I know? That's what it's called. What do I know? 50 things that school leaders must know about black history. And and, and someone could be asking, because, you know, everybody's in different places, right? So someone could be asking, but why why just black history, right? And, 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 I, and I think I've exhausted answering that in previous recordings. But we are in the in, in the in the midst of Black History Month, so that's my focus right now. But but I'm not doing a history lesson per se. I'm tying it into weaving it into school leadership. 
So I want you to think about that the whole time. I got a few things I want to talk about, but I'm weaving it into school leadership. You cannot be optimally effective as a school leader if you have black children in your school and you don't know the story of those children. But on the other hand, let's say you don't have black children, but you do live in a society that has black people. And so, so, so you still need to know the history of them. And here's, here's one of the reasons why, as I have in my notes, social racial justice, social racial injustice. You can't understand that. You can't understand the, the, the frustration, the anger, the pain, the rage of black people in terms of contemporary time. If you don't understand the history that got us to this point, that history is four centuries old. So what we did here, you know, I, of course, I'm not covering all that history. That would take a few lifetimes to do. But I, but but we talked about a few things starting off in 1619. And then we made our way to a certain area. I don't know where I stopped. Then the next week, another another uh, era. And then I stopped. And then and then now here I am. I'm going to be starting in 1954. Right. So as I always say, and I want to repeat it here this last time. Black history. That's the that's the piece that's been per, this been perennially missing from school curriculum. Yes, there are aspects of it, but in terms of the the, the full infusion, the way that it should be, because you, you can't, you know, it, we say African American history, right? I mean, I say it, or Black history, I say it, but it, but we're, what we're really talking about is giving the truth in American history. Just just give the truth. So if, so if you're truthful about American history, there there's the African American history right there embedded. So you don't have to use, you don't have to have these two separate categories. Okay, here's Black history, and here's American history. It's almost as if it's two worlds within the same country. And I'm saying here, I, I mean, I like to distinguish it because I like to highlight certain aspects of African American history. But if you're telling the truth about American history, then African American history or Black history, wh whichever language you want to use, is all the same. It's it's embedded. Well, actually, it's not the same because black history encompasses everybody. It's the whole diaspora. African-American is talking about just in this country. Right. So that's the difference. So here I'm saying that. American history has it, 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 when you look at it, a typical textbook, typical American history book. It's never been told accurately. It's never been told truthfully because the because the African-American has always been marginalized has always been trivialized, has always been distorted, has always been omitted. So that's why you got to do your own independent study. You got to do your own independent research or you need to be on this call this morning. Maybe there's somebody, one of your buddies, one of your colleagues, family, friends. Matter of fact, if you got some children in your household right now, call them, tell them to get down to the computer. I need the children to hear today's. Right. So call them to hey, principal cafe. Hey, 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 um, hey, Jalel. Principal cafe, like, you know, the guy I watch every Saturday. He said you need to watch this one. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Hey, Jamila. Come on downstairs. Principal cafe, they say you need or, or maybe they all say y'all in the southern down south. It's a little warmer outside. You yell out. the Hey, hey, Robert. Come on, come on inside. Principal Kefele say you need to sit here and watch this one. And then when they come in, give them this, right? And, and give them this. Tell them to take some notes. We're going to talk about some things. Uh, enough said. I'm ready, y'all. Y'all saying, come on, Kefele, get into it, man. Get into it. I'm ready. I'm ready. I got I got all these notes. I'm not I'm not even going to tell you how many pages of notes I have. You you might get you might like get get like I think I'm gonna leave, right? So I'm not gonna take. Um, I'm on number 32. Kim Wilson Daniels out there keeping notes. I'm on number 32. Number 32 reads, I'll tell you how to get the notes from her for the new people later on. You stay with me because you because I'm not going to tell you right now. What do I know? That's our theme. That's our recurring question. What do I know about Brown versus the Board of Education? Huh? The assumption is that everybody on the call, because I'm talking to educators, the assumption is everybody on the call knows knows um brown versus the board of education my man fitch on here fitch larue and, 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 you know the, the 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 assumption is we know it but let's let's see what we know i want i want to go back and i want to ask the question rhetorically 
who is Brown. Oh, Superintendent Finch, just remind me. I, I didn't talk about the shirt, y'all. Philadelphia Giants, this is before the Negro Leagues. Black baseball, but before the Negro Leagues were organized. Philadelphia Giants. Somebody on YouTube asked me last week, when are you going to wear the Philadelphia Stars? That's during the Negro Leagues. But I went back further. The Giants. This is 19. This is 1902. It doesn't even have a number on the back. They didn't wear numbers back in those days. Philadelphia Giants, black team uh, prior to the Negro Leagues. Let's go. Who's brown, somebody? Who's brown? Like they say, brown versus the Board of Education. Who's brown? Right? I know there are people that don't know. They just know what brown versus the Board of Education is in terms of the law, the verdict, I should say. But they don't necessarily know who brown. Let, let's talk about brown. Brown is brown's a little girl. Brown's a third grader. Her name was Linda Brown. I want y'all to stay with me because we're talking about you. Hey, leader. How are you going to lead at a high level if you don't know the history of a segment of your population? I don't, I don't see it being possible. Because in order for me to, 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 to move you, I need to know you. And I don't mean just know you in terms of your name on a birth certificate. I need to know. I, I, need, I need broader context. So, history. Linda Brown was a third grader. And see, keep in mind, after, after 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson, schools were segregated too, particularly in the South, but not confined to the South, in the North as well for a shorter period. So, so although the, there's a schoolhouse nearby, that school may have been designated for white children. So you have to go to a school that's in another part of town. My grandmother had to go miles to go to school. So here, Linda Brown, lived in Topeka, Kansas. And there was a school that was seven blocks away. It was close. But it was designated for white children. It was called Sumner Elementary School. Sumner. It's still there. I'll tell you about my visit to the school in a little while. So the school for black children, the closest school for black children was called Monroe Elementary. She had to walk six blocks, um, six blocks and, and cross over train tracks of, of active train tracks. So it was dangerous. She had to cross over the train tracks and then she had to catch a bus. So get up early, walk the six blocks, cross over the tracks and then catch a bus to Monroe when to, for, to a black school. This is it. This is in like 1952 when there was a white when there was a school seven blocks away from her house that she was not permitted to attend because she was born black. So her father, Oliver Brown, challenged the principal, challenged the school, the school district, and took her to Sumner. And they told her right in the front lobby, you, you can't go to school here. You can't go. A little third grader. So you can't go to school here. So over time, Oliver Brown, her father, filed a class action lawsuit Filed a, let me let me filed a lawsuit, class action lawsuit against the Topeka Board of Education in Kansas, right? So 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 now, the reason was because in his mind, the school that my daughter his daughter had to attend was an inferior school. In his mind, these segregated schools that that although had had had, had phenomenal teachers, they had inferior resources. So therefore, the youngsters not receiving a quality education. So I want to be very clear that I'm not condemning the teaching staff at all. Black teachers, black school, phenomenal teachers. But the resources that they had to use, right, they were substandard. So he's saying, therefore, my daughter is receiving an inferior education, and which is a violation of equal, prote of, 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 of equal protection of the law, or equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment, right? So he filed this, 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 this um, class action class action lawsuit. So the case went to Kansas district court and the judge deemed that, in fact, I think I want to quote him here. Where's it at? Um, I can't even find it in my notes. The, the judge deemed that although he agreed that learning that, that, that their education they received was detrimental. And in fact, he said it, it contributed to a sense of inferiority in black children he still decided I'm going to uphold seg the segregation laws, right? The separate, separate but equal doctrine, right? 
So then it was appealed again and ultimately made it to the Supreme Court. And but there were four other cases that were comparable to the Topeka case. So they they they, they blended them together and it became Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, all of them under that umbrella. So now they're there. Thurgood Marshall, who ultimately comes the first black Supreme Court justice, is the lead attorney from the NAACP, Legal Defense Fund and Education, Legal Defense and Education Fund. So now it's in it's it's, it's at the Supreme Court and they're split. But the lead judge, uh, Judge Fred Vincent, his feeling was we're going to uphold separate but equal. And that's direction. That's the direction it was going. But he died that year in 1953. He died. So, so President Eisenhower brought on Earl Warren as the chief justice. And he was able to get a unanimous decision that separate but equal schools is unconstitutional. I want you to hear me. Those of you that, that, uh, that are thinking, I don't, I don't want to come on for a history lesson. I'm waiting for him to get back to this. If you're an educator, and I just said something to you in terms of the detail I'm giving you that's new to you, no, you need to be right here. And, and call your children and have them come and watch as well. You need so, so that they don't grow up not knowing this, right? So no, you, you need to know this. Hit the share, hit the retweet for me, somebody. So, so, so now, I want to I want to read uh, Judge um, Chief Justice Warren's quote. He said, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place as segregated schools are inherently unequal. So it, it, it goes on. Now it's time for the schools to begin the process of desegregation toward integration. But there was resistance all over the country and particularly in the South. So there was a need for a second ruling and that was called Brown II. And the language that was used with Brown II was desegregation with all deliberate speed, right? So Brown II, when you hear Brown II, what's key in Brown II is with all deliberate speed. Right. So 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 in other words, Brown won. People, it was being ignored because be, because the South did not want de desegregation. The South did not want black children sitting in those classrooms with them. Right. So with all deliberate speed became the, the rallying cry, cry behind Brown, too. So. From there, I want to tell you, I, I, I want to share with you the aftermath but i want to go in a chronologic chronological sequence so that was 19 that was may 17 1954 and then followed up by 1955 with brown too but then and and, and i see you guys are doing a lot of writing I, I will be reading all of this right all of it but then before i get to the aftermath as it relates to education going chronologically i gotta go to August 28th, 1955. I got to talk about Emmett Till because my, 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 my whole theme is what do, what do I know? I could word it. I could have worded it as what do I need to know? Right. So what do I know? Right. So, so here Emmett Till happened. So I want, I want you to think about, think about George Floyd. Think about, uh, Think about Breonna Taylor and, and, and the whole roll call. Just 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 think about the rage behind the murders of these various different African Amer unarmed African Americans. And I want to take you to Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a young man. I know you all know the name, but let me just let me just go through this because there could be some out there that don't know. Emmett Till was a young man from Chicago, 14 years old, who was who, who they say was fairly, fairly large for his size, for his age. He had gone down to Mississippi, Money, Mississippi, to stay with his great uncle in the summer of 1955. He and family members, uh, young family members and, and, and friends had gone to a store called Bryant's Grocery in, um, in, in Money, Mississippi. A store that if, later on, if those of you, I did a Facebook Live in front of, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it has remains, right? It's eroded significantly, but it's still there. I did a Facebook Live there for about 45 minutes about three years ago. You go on my Facebook page to the albums folder and just scroll the videos and you'll see it. 
right? So I stood in front of that store about 45 minutes just telling the people what I'm about to tell you. So he goes into the store and then this is where it gets a little murky because some feel, so some, some, some allege that he whistled at this white woman, the, the woman who, the wife of the owner of the store, Carolyn Bryant. Others, uh, the, the other accounts are he, he grabbed her hand as he was exchanging this bubble gum for the money. The other one is he grabbed her waist and said that he's been with white women before, right? But we're going to get to all that in terms of what actually happened in, in sequentially. But for, but for now, this is these were the allegations. So now that was on August 24th, 1955. So then four days later, as the husband is made aware, because he was out of town, he's uh, he, he worked on the road doing various jobs, driving trucks and so forth. So when he came, when his name was Roy Bryant, when he came home, and his wife informed him on the 28th, him and his brother, by the name of J.W. Malam, they went to Mose Wright's home, who Mose Wright, who some people say Moses, but it's actually Mose. They went to his home, who was the great uncle of Emmett Till. And that's who Emmett Till was staying with. They went to his home and they literally kidnapped him from his home in broad daylight. They kidnapped him. And then they took him to a place, to a barn, and they literally beat him beyond recognition they mute they mutilated him they gouged an eye they stripped him down they they they, they ultimately tied a a a 75 pound um cotton gin around his neck with barbed wire was was what they tied with what they connected it to and then they threw him in the tallahatchie river right so they threw him in the tallahatchie river and, he's, and his body remained there for three days until one day some kids were fishing and they saw the it saw his feet in the water. And then that's when the body was retrieved. So they wanted to bury him immediately. But his mother, who's back in Chicago, who did, did not want him to come to Mississippi in the first place. She said, "Nah, I want the world to see what happened to my son. They beat him beyond to the point where he was beyond recognition. He, you, you'd never know who that was, and you can Google the image. You know, it's, it's on it's on the internet. It's all over the internet. So that so the funeral was conducted with an open casket, so the world could see it. And then Jet Magazine, a black magazine, and ultimately the media went on and 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 um and published the picture of Emmett Till in the casket. Right. So I'm saying that I'm saying I'm I'm sharing this with you for a few reasons. Number one is because this was one of the, the precursors to the civil rights movement because this created a whole lot of outrage. So you can't talk about civil rights movement. You can't talk about Dr. King. You can't talk about John Lewis. You can't talk about any of that if you don't talk about Emmett Till. You got to talk about Emmett Till. So I'm saying to you, school leader, you have to know that. I mean, I mean, I, I'm saying to you, it is absolutely imperative that you be armed with this kind of information. Now, the case went to court, but the two killers were acquitted. They were acquitted, so they walked. They said there's, they, they said there wasn't enough evidence because because they couldn't identify if that was really him, although he had a ring. That, that, he, that he had gotten from his mother that was that had the initials of his father in the ring. So it was him. But then, so, 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 so now they acquitted. The next year in 1956, they gave an a, a exclusive interview to Look Magazine for $4,000, the two brothers that killed Emmett Till. They gave an exclusive interview to Look Magazine for $4,000 and confessed to the murder. They confessed. But based on the, the laws down there and, and, and something dealing with double jeopardy, the case was not reopened. So they went on the rest of their lives free. And then around 2000, I forget what year, I think it was 2017, but don't quote me on that one. But I think that's around what year it was. Maybe I have it in my notes. <laughs> no, I don't. The, um, the, the, the wife gave an interview and she recanted her whole story. She said it didn't happen. It was an interview for a magazine and an interview for a book. She said it, it, it didn't happen. She made it up. See, so that's a part of the rage. When you when you see this rage today, it's not in isolation. It's it's ancestral deep. Right. It's ancestral deep. You got it. You got to understand it. 
so 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 and i gave you a short version there's so much more to say but i got to stay focused on why i'm on so now i talked to you about brown versus the board of education i want to go back to education now because now now i want to look at here see see now that the, the test the uh brown two decision it was put to a test and that test started with little rock central high school in little rock arkansas let's talk about it if you go on my facebook page you look at my cover photo that's the photo of the little rock nine being escorted into the building by the u.s army but we'll get to that we'll get to that let's 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 talk about some things here brown versus i mean little rock nine the attendance of of of, of, of these segregated schools being put to the test here you had the board of education in little rock they wanted to make this thing gradual, right? They 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 they, they didn't want to like bam, let's let's bring let's let's end desegregation and, and have black and white children sitting together in classrooms. They they said, now we 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 gonna do this thing slowly, right? We're gonna do this thing gradually. But see, NAACP down there, strong NAACP in Little Rock, led by the great da uh, Daisy Gatson Bates, right? Daisy Gatson Gaston Bates, man. Not only was she the president of the NAACP, but she was also the co-publisher of the black newspaper there, the Arkansas Free Press. So she's going to put the Brown to the test. She's going to put it to the test. So now they, they went on and recruited some black students, but they vetted these black students because they knew what they were going to be confronted by. So they so they, they came up with these nine students. And they went through a series of counseling sessions to get them ready for what they were going to face. Because 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 with them being as young as they were, high school students, great all from freshman to uh, senior year, they probably couldn't imagine what they were going to face in terms of integrating into Little Rock Central High School. So they recruited students, they interviewed the students, and they and they and they decided on these nine, and just counseling, counseling counseling how to conduct oneself how, how to be mentally prepared how to be emotionally prepared for 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 just the barrage of hate that was going to come their way so finally on september the 4th that was going to be the first day of school so on september 4th they were met by this huge angry white mob you remember I told you that, that Saturday after January 6th, I told you what we saw at that Capitol, <laughs> that we seen that energy in America over and over and over. So when those youngsters got to Little Rock Central on September 4th, 19, I didn't give you the year, 1957, you had this angry white adult mob outside waiting for them. That's on the one hand. But you also had the Arkansas National Guard waiting for them. Because the governor of, Little Rock, of Arkansas, Orville uh, Faubus, he commissioned the um, the Ar Arkansas National Guard to block the entrance of the school and not let them in. So those young people got there and they were not allowed to enter school. But interestingly, they carpooled. So it's nine of them. But they changed plans the morning of. And as they were reaching out to each of the nine, one of them didn't get the call. Her name's Elizabeth Eckford. So she arrived without the other the other eight. So here she is. You've seen the pictures. Here she is. She's walking through that angry mob. And they're cussing at her. They're threatening her. They're calling her the N-word. They're spitting on her. It, 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 it was a wild scene. You can go, you can Google this. It's all there. You know, I'm just I'm just giving it to you off the top of my head, but it's all there. I got, and I got notes to keep me on keep me on point, right? So it's all there. You 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 can go and check it out. So now they couldn't get in, so they continued to try, continued to try, but they couldn't get into the building. So Brown, in terms of putting Brown versus the Board of Education to the test, it was not happening, right? It was not happening. So now, let me just put this up here. So now. The, the president of the United States has to get involved, President Eisenhower again. So what he does, the first, first, he federalizes the state National Guard. So that now they become U.S. National Guard.
But then he sends in 1,200 U.S. Army troops from the 101st Airborne out of Kentucky. So now he sends in 1,000 troops and federalizes 10,000. Can you imagine that? I mean, let me say that again for anybody, because I know there's some young heads on here and you don't know this history. He had to send in 1,200 soldiers, armed, uniformed soldiers to Little Rock Central High School. And he federalized all 10,000 of, of, of the statewide Arkansas National Guard. So a lot of them, therefore, were at the school that morning of September 25th. And I might add, because I'm, I'm trying not to get too heavy into this, but on September 24th, when, when Eisenhower made the order, the police were used. But the police were defied. Just as the police were defied at the Capitol on January 6th, where they were defied at Little Rock, Arkansas. So the mob went into the building. The students, the nine had gotten in because the police were there to escort them in. But the mob defied the police as they did on January 6, 2021. I told you we have seen this energy before. So they defied the police and went on in the building. So now... The, the administration had to send those nine out of there and get them, get them to safety. So they, they dismissed them, sent them out so that they can leave grounds. And it, that's the point when the, when the army had to come in. So Eisenhower said, okay, we can't use police. We'll, we'll use our troops. Imagine that the troops to get the youngsters to school. And that's how it worked. So now, although the troops had, had were there, it wasn't it, it, it wasn't totally safe for the youngsters in the building because they face ongoing harassment and violence within the school. I, and I don't want to indict that whole student population. In fact, the, the one student who was a senior and the one who graduated that year, Ernest Green, I'm a, I'm, I quoted him. So I want to read it. He said things would be better if only the grownups wouldn't mix in. This is what this is what this is what a, he was 16 at the time. He said kids have nothing against us. They hear bad things about us from their parents. That's what he said. So, so, so he's saying the children are being taught by the adults to hate. So now you've got them going to school, but they, they're undergoing harassment and, and violence every day. One of the students, her name was, was, uh, was Minnie Jean, Minnie Jean Brown. She was expelled, one of the nine. She was expelled because she got to the point where she couldn't tolerate it anymore. So she took a bowl of chili and put it on a kid's head and they, you know, they, they, they expelled her for it. Right. Another student, Gloria Ray, her mother was fired from, from her job because she had a state job. So the state said, if you don't remove your student, your, your daughter from that school, we're going to fire you. And they fired her. She was fired. Right. So, so, so just ongoing, but to keep it short, ultimately Ernest Green graduated. He was the first one to graduate. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a lot of people don't know this, he attended that graduation. That's 1957. We're talking about before Birmingham, before Albany, Georgia, right after the Montgomery bus boycott. Dr. Martin Luther King was at that, was, was, was at that, um, that graduation. Also, now watch this. The next year, the governor was so upset he said, we're closing all high schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. We're not, we, we, we went through this year with Little Rock Central. We're not, but, but, but now, because some of, them, some of them transferred because of the harassment. He said, we're not, we're not keeping these schools open. So for the, he, said, he said, pending a vote by the community. The community voted whether to keep the schools open or closed. They voted 19,470 to 7,561 to close the schools. So the schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, high schools were closed for the entire 1958-59 school year. Imagine that. Because they didn't want black ch children to attend. Right. So the white children had the opportunity to go to other districts or, 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 or to be schooled within the community or, 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 or homeschooled. Then they had that. But just imagine all them black children who had no education. now, Right. Or had to report back to the black schools if they could. But that's but 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 see, all of the high schools were closed. So if they went to a school, it had to be outside of Little Rock, right? So then that's why I say if they could. But then, but look, before I go to my next subject, 
I want to remind everybody on this call. I want I want to thank you for your your for for your willingness to to stay here and listen to this since this is not necessarily what this is, right? But you need to know this. If if I know it, you need to know. It. So let's let's continue with this aftermath, right? Let's continue with this aftermath. Virginia, I want to go to the state of Virginia. Y'all Virginians out there, y'all y'all y'all. If you don't know this, you're gonna know it now. Virginia. They they fought they 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 fought vehemently against desegregation. Let me tell you how bad it was. Senator Harry H Harry Byrd at that time, he instituted what was called massive resistance. This was just the creation of various different laws to keep to to, to prevent having to desegregate the schools in the state of Virginia. Right? Ma it was called massive resistance. So now a lot of the whites, they began to leave these schools and, and, and they started creating these private academies. Right. And then there were these threats of violence and intimidation, just like in Little Rock, toward the black folks. So here was the bold move in 1959. Prince Edward County School District. This is a district that exists right now. I've spoken there. Prince Edward County School District shut down the entire district they shut it down now now i'm looking at the comments a lot of you are saying wow and all that kind of stuff that so that's good that means i'm that means i'm relevant because i'm telling you some things that you may not have realized prince edward county in virginia i remember when they invited me to speak there and i knew about this this is going back a few years and i said wow i'm going to that district in that something they shut down the entire district let me tell you how long five years now, my wife said there was a special on TV the other night. You know, they put these black history programs on like after midnight on a lot of these channels. So, so it was real late. I was asleep. I don't sleep. I'm not up that late. But she watched it. And, and five years, Prince Edward County in Virginia, they said we, 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 will, we will deny education before we let these black bodies come into these classrooms with these white students. So they shut it down completely. But here's what happened. The white officials in Virginia were able to get tuition grants, right? From uh, tuition grants from the state and tax credits from the county to create private schools for white children. Y'all didn't hear me. The white officials got tuition grants from, from the state and tax credits from the county and, and established private schools for white students during that five year period. Black students didn't get that. Black students, either had to, you know, some of the churches created schools, so to speak, but they weren't accredited, obviously, but created schools in church basements or, 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 or there was tutoring that took place in homes or those that could travel away from home and went to school in, with, with family in other states, other cities, that type of thing. Other states, I should say, not other cities, but other states, right? So they had to travel. But I want you just, I just want you to let that resonate for a minute. Entire school district shut down for five years for the sole reason that we don't want black children attending our schools. That's 1959. I'm born in 1960. So that means that for four years of my life, there were schools where black children could not attend on the basis of race. The same reason they couldn't play major league baseball and had to wear these jerseys. Black leagues and Negro leagues, right? So, so, but, 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 but it gets, it gets, it gets wilder, y'all. Stay with me. In September 1958, schools in Norfolk, Virginia, Charlottesville, uh, we know something about Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia, and Warren County were on the verge of integration via court order but they were closed by the state officials. Norfolk, Charlottesville, Warren County. I keep telling you, I told, I told you January 6th, nothing new. We've seen that energy. But Charlottesville, we saw that and we saw that two summers ago. But they, but 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 see, we've seen this energy before. I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not indicting Charlottesville. I know, I I I I know. Because I because I've met people all over the state of Virginia, but I'm talking about the history, right? The history. So here, let me keep going. 
a matter of fact, I'm going I'm to I'm stop that part there. Let me, let me, I got some more that I need you guys to know. I want to go to February 1st, 1960. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? If you are, hit that share button, hit that retweet button. I'm just giving a little history. I, I, I'll be back here. But right now, I mean, I, I don't know. Let, let, I'm going to say something bold right now. You know, it's a lot of it's a lot of people. It's tons of people in this world in, in America. I, I, let me reduce it to America that do what I do as far as being a consultant and education speaker, you know, all that kind of stuff. But but I'm just wondering out loud, how many of them are on on, on, on a podcast or on a live doing this work? See, see what I'm doing now talking this. I mean, this could make some of my clients angry. This could cost me money. This could cost me opportunity. I, I understand that. But you know something? That's all right. God got me. That's all right. I'm good with it. This information needs to be shared. These stories need to be told. So I'm not going to run away from them uh, so I could go out and make a dollar. You understand me? And that's, and that's the mindset you got to bring to your work. You know, when we talked about having a spine and a backbone and the audacity. You know, we've talked about that for like weeks, right? Months since I've been doing this academy. Well, as a presenter, I too have to have a, a spine. I too have to have a backbone. I can't just talk about the soft topics so that everybody loves Kefele and the business keeps rolling. Sometime I got to go against the grain and give you some truths that everybody may not want to hear, right? That's, that's, that's called real leadership. So my colleagues out there in the world, I'm, I'm, I'm watching them. You, you better believe it because I want to see, see if, if you deviate from your soft topics and deal with these tough topics that need to be addressed as well. Enough said. Let's go to February 1st, 1960. Greensboro 4. You know, I'm, I'm just I'm not covering all of the questions today, by the way. I'm, I'm just going. I'm, I, 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 what I did was highlighted areas that I felt I needed to give particular focus to. On February 1st, 1960, four freshman students, four black men, young black men from North Carolina A&T, they decided, they, they had been planning for days. They said, we, 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 we have to be served at that lunch counter at that Woolworths, right? Because see, in their conversations, because I've read some of their quotes, they said, matter of fact, I, I want to read to you. Let me, let me read to you what one of them said. Matter of fact, I, let, me, let me give you something else first, and then, I, then I'll come back to it. So so, so they plotting and planning, like, let's just go in the Woolworths. Because, see, at the Woolworths department store in Greensboro, North Carolina, you could shop. So you could buy anything. But you couldn't go to that lunch counter. See, you couldn't go there. That was reserved for white people. You, But anything else in the store, you know, you got a lot of trinkets in them little five and dime stores back in them days. You could buy anything. Ain't nobody going to bother you. But when it came time to go to get something to eat, you, you're not sitting at that lunch counter. You're not being served at that lunch counter. They had a they had a takeout line. So you go to the takeout line, but you were not going to be, you could you could not sit in those stools. So so here these four, they freshmen, y'all, not seniors and, and juniors and been there for a while and, and, and getting, you know, and growing intellectually, growing politically. These are freshmen out of high school. And they said, look, enough. So they said, let's go to the Woolworths. Let's go buy some things and then let's venture over to the lunch counter. Hit that share button. If you got children in your house right now and they somewhere playing a video game, I'm going to say politely, shame on you, right? If you got children sitting in your crib right now and they somewhere watching a video game or they on the phone, they listening to music, whatever it is, and I'm talking this and they ain't sitting there with you? Come on. They need I, and, and 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 you know the excuse, but they've been in school online all week. I right. but they didn't get this unless they had somebody very progressive. So 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 get them kids downstairs and watch this too. So now they go on into what in February 1st, 1960. I'm not even born yet, I'm born October 22nd, 1960. So now they go into the Woolworths and they, they buy some things. Then they, they look at each other. I'm, I'm telling you how it went down. They didn't even say nothing. They just looked at each other. They said, let's go. And they went over there and they sat next to each other, four stools. Hear me, y'all, four stools. And that, that waitress, she was white. 
she looked at him and she said, we don't serve Negroes here, right? And they, they questioned it, why not, right? We, we don't serve Negroes here. And she wouldn't serve them. So here comes the manager. Uh, you, 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 you can't sit here. You can't sit here. We don't serve Negroes. You can, you can go to the takeout line and order your food. They didn't get up. They didn't get up. Remember, we talked about backbone, spine, courage, or da- audacity, temerity. They sat. They sat there. So now the manager calls the police. <laughs> Here come the police, and this is one police officer had his billy club out, right? And he started like like doing this with it, like hitting his palm with it, and he would pace back and forth uh, 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 next to them. So back and forth alongside of them, hitting his billy club, saying, you can't sit here. You can't sit here. Remember, the civil rights movement, in, 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 in a formal sense, it hadn't started outside of Montgomery with the bus boycott, right? There are pockets of things happening across the country, but I don't know how privy they would have been to it. So now... The police officers decide for whatever reason to retreat and didn't force them out. So now the manager, he's frustrated. He closes the store. So he said the store, we're not going full day today. Stores closed. So now everybody had to leave. So they felt it as a victory. Now I want to read with you one of the one of the four, they're called the Greensboro Four. One of them is named Frederick McLean. I I just want to read this, what I wrote here. He said, And he died in 2014 at the age of 73 and has spoken about how he had been dispirited. Hear me, dispirited and traumatized living under segregation that he felt suicidal as a teenager. Dispirited and traumatized living under segregation to the extent that he felt suicidal. Like he want to take his life because this this segregation is just too much. So, So think about that. That's just one individual. Think about the masses of others who are living under. I can't imagine. I mean, I, I cannot imagine walking down the street somewhere and, and two signs, one saying blacks only. I mean, black, black and the, or Negroes and the other one saying white or colored. I can't imagine complying with that. I just cannot. I can't. I can't fathom it. Because I never lived it. So I'm not going to say I wouldn't have done it, but it's just it's, it's, it's too far reaching for me to imagine that I would have not going into that room that says that it says white right so now or whites only so now he said he often told how the experience of sitting down in the simple chrome stool so he's talking about when he went to that counter that lunch counter sitting in that simple chrome stool with its vinyl seat immediately transfigured him now here's the quote He said, almost instantaneously after sitting down on a simple dumb stool, I felt relieved. I felt so clean. I felt as though I had gained a little bit of manhood, my manhood, by that simple act. Can you imagine it? He felt like he had gained some level of manhood by sitting in that chair and defying those racist segregationist laws, right? So now, let me keep it going. He go, they go back to the campus, North Carolina A&T. And all these places I'm talking about, by the way, these are places I visit on a regular basis. I got YouTube videos in front of all of them. Go to my um, message, to a, message to your son and go to the playlist where it says Black History. You'll see me sitting at the front steps or at the, fr- at the front entrance of Little Rock Central High School. You'll see me. What's the other one I talked about? You'll see me at, at the... Um, on the Selma, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you'll see me at Money, Mississippi. I mean, all these places. You'll see me at Moton Field, where where the Tuskegee Airmen train. You'll see me at the at the birthplace of Malcolm X. I mean, I go to these places and make videos, right? So now they get back to campus. They feeling good. They talk to the to um to the to the college to the college classmates to the students there, and and this thing this thing blows up. So for, by February the fourth. The campaign had grown to hundreds of students, hundreds of students going into Woolworths. You can, you can see the videos on YouTube, but now it's expanding to other cities. And by March, a month later, it's in 55 cities, sitting movement, 13 states. So now Ella Baker, if you don't know this name, lock it in. 
Ella Baker, longtime activist, black woman, she organizes a conference at Shaw University in, in April 1960 because now you got all these pockets of sit-ins going on all over the country. So she said, we got to bring this under one umbrella. And hence, that's when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as SNCC was created, right? John Lewis, he was a part of it because he was organizing in Nashville at the time with Diane Nash and Jim Lawson. Those are names you also should know. So they're organizing sit-ins in Nashville. And then you got, so you got 55 cities. Here's Ella Baker. Look, we got to bring this under one umbrella. And hence you got SNCC. And eventually John Lewis became the president of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Let me keep going. I got a question here. I'm on, that, that was number 35. Number 36 says, what do I know about the Montgomery bus boycott? I ain't got time to go into all that. It's 11.56, but I'm going to say this because because there's some things I'm still going to go into. Y'all going to have to ride with me for a while because I, because I do have more to talk about, but I'm not going to get heavy with the bus boycott. All I'm going to say is it was 381 days of sustained effort, sustained action that those the dumb, the dumb black folks said we ain't riding these buses until we are treated like everybody else. Imagine, imagine you get on a bus, pay the fare at the front of the bus, then got to walk to the back door and get on the bus and sit in the back of the bus with no guarantees that the driver was going to wait for you to get on in the back on, through the back door. Because in many cases, they drove off. So, so enough was enough. Imagine sit. I mean, here's another one I can't, I, I just can't picture that I'm sitting on the bus, a white man, white woman, white child walks on the bus, and I have to get up and give up my seat while I'm sitting in the black section of the bus, mind you. Because once the white section filled up, then the black section became the white section. So now once the white section filled up, if there were no seats in the white section, then you go to the black section and the black person had to get up and give up their seat so that the white man, white woman, white child could sit down. I can't imagine myself getting up. I just can't. I don't have that kind of spirit. Of course, I was not there. So I don't want to I don't want to come across, you know, like like, you know, you got that revision is not, not revision, but that 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 sun, that Monday morning armchair quarterbacking sounds good, buddy. And I don't want to be that guy. Right. But I just can't imagine that I'm just going to give up my seat because I'm black. But but see, you have children in your schools and this is my whole point. You have children in your schools that don't know this. They don't know it. I know that. And but but what happens if there's children in the school that don't know it, but there are teachers in the school that don't know it, and there's administrators in the school that don't know it, or who know it but are intimidated by talking about it? Then we just doing everybody a disservice. We got to talk about it. Let me keep going. That was 36. I'm I'm, I'm just gonna leave it at what do I know about the Montgomery bus boycott? This I need an hour for that one. Number 37. What do I know about the four little girls? I need an hour for this one too. In fact, I may I was deliberate in not writing too many notes here because I don't want to I, I don't want to spend too much time. All I'm gonna tell you is I spent a lot of time at that 16th Street Baptist Church. Man, let's 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 just break it down a little bit. Look here, I don't know about the weather where you are, but I'm on the east coast. I'm in the northeast. It's raining. I ain't got nothing to do, y'all, but talking to this computer. So 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 do do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Stay here. It's 12 o'clock. Stay here. Let's let's keep this going. So, so, so here in 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King launched Project C, Project Confrontation, to, 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 to fight against uh, discrimination in public accommodations, um, discrimination in, 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 in employment, et cetera. And the rallying place, the meeting hall, somebody said, I'm listening. Y'all said, y'all, y'all, I said, so y'all gonna hang with me? Okay, hang with me. So, so, so the rallying place, the meeting place, the organizing place was the 16th Street Baptist Church. King spoke there like every week, right? So, and, and, and I mean, so many others as well, right? So, so now here they are. That's that's the spot, right there. So the 16th Street Baptist Church. So now, segregationists were upset about that because ultimately, in that that Project C. I appreciate that, Marcus Jackson, Dr. Jackson. So ultimately, those laws were overturned in Birmingham. So now there's rage, and 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 the first the, the first evidence of rage, there was a, there was a hotel, the Gaston Hotel, 
where the organizers, the leaders used to meet and strategize. See, see, the 16th Street Baptist Church was the rallying place for the public. But then the meet, but but then the leaders would have their meetings at a black owned motel called Gaston Motel. Motel or hotel, I get it mixed up all the time. For, for, for decades, I, I can't lock it in my mind which one it is. So, but you can look that up or, unless you want to put it on the thread, feel free. So now they meeting there regularly. Black owned motel, hotel, Gaston is the name. So after the af, after those after the decision to, to, to change those laws in Birmingham, the Gaston was blown up. It was bombed right at the front. But then Dr. King, um, Dr. King's brother, A.D. King, who lived in Birmingham at that time, his house was bombed. And then over the years, you had church bombings. But, but the 16th Street Baptist Church, that was in the eye of the storm because that's the church where all the, the meetings were taking place, all the rallies, packed, standing room only. Right. Fred Shuttlesworth, another prominent voice. In, in um do, during the civil rights movement. So now on a Sunday morning, September 15, 1963, it's just a regular Sunday morning. It's 200 parishioners in the church before Klansmen planted 15 sticks or more. Minimally, we know it was at least 15 sticks under the back steps. And they detonated these, these, these 15 sticks at 1022. They placed a call and said, Three minutes. That's what they said. Three minutes. And in less than three minutes, explosion. And then the names, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to read Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair. They lost their lives age 14, 14, 14, and 11, respectively. And then Sarah Collins, Rudolph, follow her on Facebook. Just go right on her page and send her a friend request. She was the fifth little girl. She lost her sight in one eye. Right. But she's still a survivor. She just wrote a book on it. I'm going to get that book and share it with you guys. But she but 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 she's on Facebook like every day. Sarah Collins Rudolph, the sister of Addie Mae Collins. Right. We met her a few years ago and, you know, they good. They, her and her husband, they great people. Right. So follow. Send her a friend request. Sarah, uh, Sa Sarah um, Rudolph Collins. So now here's the thing. They weren't even they 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 did they, they weren't even indicted until years later. The case got reopened somewhere around uh, I don't know seventy seven and maybe probably probably early. I don't have a date in my mind right now because I'm too amped up right now. But J Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the the FBI at the time, did not allow that case to to proceed. And then they 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 walked. They walked. Right. So there, there, there's so much more to say about that. But 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 what I want to say. Those four little girls, they weren't the only ones that died that day. And see, a lot of times we when we talk about September 15, 1963, we we, we think about the four little girls we, as we should. And the fifth little girl, Sarah Collins. But they're two little boys. And we sometimes either forget them or don't know them. Let me let me just give you the short version. Number one, a young man by the name of Virgil Ware, Virgil Ware, 13, he was riding on a bicycle with his brother. He was riding on the handlebars and they were on their way to a, to a relative's house to get some food. And two white, two white, young white men were on a motorbike and they were coming from a, a anti-integration rally. So they saw Virgil Ware in Birmingham and on the bike with his brother. And, 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 and allegedly one of them closed his eyes and just shot his gun. You know, I say allegedly because I don't, I don't believe that. You know, you close your eyes and you happen to hit him. So it hit him in the chest, the, Virgil and the cheek. And he died. They were given seven months manslaughter suspended sentence and two years probation. In 1965, they were free. Virgil Ware. Then on the same day, another young black man, Johnny Robinson, 
He was amongst a crowd of African Americans who were near a gas station, but there was another crowd of white because this was on the day of the of the four little girls. So a crowd of white young men who were throwing rocks at them. So they retaliate. The police come. They take off running. The blacks, the blacks, the, the black young men. The police officer, as we've seen for decades, takes out his revolver, shoots, and kills Johnny Robinson, age 16. He was never he was never indicted, never arrested. And then years after he died, they decided to reopen the case. But but I'm, I'm sharing this with you because you're leaders. Some of you are just some of you are not necessarily leaders. You may be teachers, but you lead in the classroom with your students or on the computer virtually. But the bottom line is you need to know this. So the four little girls and the two little boys. And they're not little, but the four little, we, we say little girls, I just, you know, just parallel, but the four little girls and four, four boys, because they were a little bit older than the girls. Number 38, what do I know about the March on Washington? Man, I need an hour for that, so I'm not even going to get into it. I'm not even going to broach it. I'm going to keep going. Number 39, this will be the last one that I kind of explain, I think, and then the rest of them, I'm just going to kind of list, and then that'll, that way I could respect you guys' time and appreciate you guys for being here. Uh, Tammy, that was Johnny Robinson. Just uh, Google it, and it's it's, it's Johnny with an N I E, right? Not 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 N Y. So Johnny Robinson. There's a whole lot on the internet about him and Virgil Ware, right? So so and, and and I'm glad you guys are like you know well I ain't know this stuff. Yeah yeah, because that's because it's not in the curriculum, right? So you and I could go K twelve and then spend eight spend four years in undergrad school, another two years in master with a master's uh, graduate school, and not even know things that happen right under our noses number 39 you know this one but i i just got some things to say about it not too much what do i know about bloody sunday and see i'm not going I don't, i'm not going to really focus on the march i want to focus on something that's lesser known when 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 dr king and selc and subsequently snick went to selma to challenge the voting laws there they they arrived there in January. The um the march didn't happen till March seventh. There so there was a whole lot going on there in terms of in term in terms of a campaign to to oppose these laws. You know there there there, there were various different marches and rallies to oppose these laws. You know uh, in terms of uh, poll tax literacy tests. For though there could be somebody watching right now that didn't know that if you were black and you wanted to vote in the South. You, you, they may have administered a literacy test to you <clears throat> to literally test to test you in that regard to see if you could vote, knowing that that I've got someone here that's uneducated, may not be able to read and therefore I can deny vote. Or they may give you a bottle. A, watch this. A jar, a, a huge jar filled with marbles. And in order to be able to vote, they say, tell us how many marbles are in the jar or how many jelly beans are in the jar. Now, who's going to know that? But if you didn't know, you could not vote. If you couldn't read a passage, you could not vote. If you couldn't answer certain questions on a test that had nothing to do with voting, you couldn't vote. Right. So 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 now you say you had the or you had to pay a tax. They call it a poll tax. So you had poll tax, literacy, literacy tests. You, 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 you had these 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 jelly bean marble tests and these jars. You had all this. So, that, so they went to Selma to say, look, let's let's use Selma as the example to overturn these 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 racist these racist voting voting rights laws. So through the various different protest demonstrations, there was a young man who worked closely with Dr. King by the name of uh, James Orange, right? James Orange. And he also was a field secretary for the NAACP, I understand. But he worked closely with Dr. King with SCLC. Well, he was arrested. So there was a there was a march and rally to protest his being arrested. And the police came and they chased everybody off. This is this is before the march uh, across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. So they scattered in different directions. Some went, ran in the stores, some into shops and businesses and so forth. They just scattered. Well, one young man by the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson, he ran into a cafe called Max, Max Cafe, and his mother. 
And he ran in there and the police followed him in there. It's in the movie Selma, but everybody didn't see it. So they, they followed him in there. And he he's trying to protect his mother. And he was up against the wall and they shot him and they killed him. That became a catalyst for the march on March 7, 1965. The trooper wasn't indicted until 42 years later in 2007. So when the march finally occurred on March 7, 1965, and, and by the way, Dr. King was not at that initial march because he had business to contend with back in Atlanta at Ebenezer. But then they marched across. And then, you know, the story of Bloody Sunday. So I don't I don't need to go into that. You know that you you, you know that the, the, the people were just beaten, beaten mercilessly. Right. So and then that led to the second march on March the 9th that King did leave. But they only went to the apex of the bridge. They prayed. And then they turned back and went back to the meeting place, which was the Brown Chapel in Selma. And then once they got the court injunction on March 21st, they marched for the next four days till March 25th. And then ultimately the Voting Rights Act came out of that. Right. So. That's that's kind of that's kind of where, where I want to leave it. I just I want to just throw these questions at you. I'm not going to get I'm not going to get heavy with the rest of this at all. I just want you to. Take these questions. I know Kim Wilson Daniel, who's at uh, Twitter, Kim at Kim Wilson Daniel, and at fa on Facebook at Kimberly Wilson Daniel. I know she takes these notes. I'm, I'm assuming she's doing that today, and you'll have these questions, right? So, question number 40 said, What do I know about the treatment of black soldiers after the Civil War? See, when I put this agenda together, I'm thinking that I could like cover all this before 12. Not re not thinking about as I do every week that I'm gonna fill in all the the you know fill everything in with the extra 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 right so that's you know that's what I do that's the teacher in me for those of you that don't know my first name Baruti you know my first name is not principal right my first name Baruti that word comes from Botswana in Southern Africa the language is called Tiswana but the meaning of the word is teacher Baruti means teacher. So I'm a teacher. So I can't just read off stuff like I create I create these agendas with all these notes. Right. I can't just read the agenda because the teacher in me wants to fill in the, the blanks, the gaps, so to speak. Right. So I got it. So, so, you know, so that's you know, that. but that's what teachers do. So now. Number 40, what do I know about the treatment of black soldiers after, after the Vietnam War? Number 41, what do I know about the civil rights movement? So it's so much more. Than just what we talked about right what do i know about it though that's recent history what do i know about the civil rights act of 1964 i just wrote a quick note to myself to stay on point let me just read it prohibited discrimination in employment and in places of public accommodation outlawed bias in federally funded programs and created the equal employment opportunity commission that's all i'm gonna say i read that to you so that i wouldn't go on a tangent number 43 what do I know about the Voting Rights Act? Right. I don't need to go into that because I, I talked about that before. Number 44. What do I know about the Black Power Movement? Oh, man. See, a lot of times we think about the Civil Rights Act and we use that language to encompass everything that happened throughout the 60s. Well, that's incorrect. Because the Civil Rights Movement morphed literally, particularly in the North into the black power movement that's where groups such as the black panther party come out of the us organization and so many others that emerge post let's say post 65 right so so so, so man there's so much i want to say about that but i don't have the time so so post 65 post selma now you got something else brewing in america in these urban centers this black power movement, starting with the 1966 Oakland, California, Huey Newton, Bobby Seal, the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense, right? But there's so much more to say. You do the research. Num that was number 44. Number 45, what do I know about COINTELPRO? Let me say this, y'all. Stay with me. I see them numbers, y'all, kind of up and down now. I'm almost done. Hit that share button one more time. Hit that retweet button for me one more time. 
you know, there's a lot of excitement about a new movie. I saw it a couple of weeks ago. Um, Judas, what, what's it called? Judas and the Messiah? Judas and the Black Messiah? Whatever, whatever it is, right? It's about Fred Hampton. I don't, I, you know, I just don't remember the exact title, but it's about Chairman Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party, chairman of the Illinois branch of the Black Panther Party based in Chicago. But it's, but it's really not about Fred Hampton. It's about, it's, it's about the infiltration of the organization under what's called COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program of the FBI. So here, every notable civil rights and black power organization, including Dr. King's group and including John Lewis's SNCC, were infiltrated through surveillance, infiltration, discrediting, disruption, misdirecting, neutralizing, and assassination. Infiltration, right? So I need like 10 hours to talk about that, right? I don't, you know, we, I don't have that. And I don't know that this is necessarily the form that I would want to discuss that, but I, I want to make sure that I put it in the question. Do you know what it is? Because there are people, there, there are naive people in our, in our, in, in our midst who, 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 who cannot fathom that, for example, let me give you this example. Malcolm X, I'll give you this one example. His chief bodyguard, I mean, the one that was responsible for protecting him. Imagine your, if you had a bodyguard, the main person in your life who their role in life is to protect you, to keep you alive. Well, it turned out that his chief bodyguard was working for the FBI. That's documented. That ain't that ain't Cafe Lace conspiracy theory. That's documented. His chief bodyguard, his name was Gene Roberts. He was he was he was he was working for the FBI. So everywhere Malcolm went, they knew because he articulated it to the person he thought was close to him. So they were always steps ahead of him because he didn't know that he had been infiltrated, the organization, which ultimately, it, again, it's, sur it's surveillance, it's infiltration, discrediting, disruption, misdirecting, neutralizing, and ultimately assassination, right? So much to know, so much to know. Hey, Superintendent Finch, yeah, that book, um, Stokely Carmichael, you gotta read that one for those, he, he put it at Black Power. And, and and it's 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 so much I want to say about that book, but I'm trying not to let myself deviate, right? So maybe another time, because it's a powerful book. Who he ultimately became Kwame Toure, right? When he when he changed his name. Let me keep going. Number forty six. Here's one that I got to fight myself not to get deep into. What do I know about the Black Studies movement? Once again, what do I know about the Black Studies movement? That 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 was initiated at San Francisco State College in 1968. Do yourselves a favor, y'all. When you get off of here, go to YouTube and put in Black Studies slash San Francisco State College 1968 and see what these young people were doing back then. Number 46, number 47, I'm sorry. What do I know about the struggle for black racial justice beyond the 60s and the 70s? So in other words, I'm asking you, what do you know about the 80s? What do you know about the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, up to 2021? What do you know? I'm asking you, what do you know? Because, because as we get closer to like the 80s up to now, we're talking about now. And do you understand contemporary issues? But do you understand issues beyond the lives of, of, of Dr. King and Malcolm and Huey Newton and Bobby Seale? What, what do you know about post these, these individuals? Number, 40, um, number 48, what do I know about the historical and contemporary tensions between the black community and the police, which includes the mass incarcerate, incarceration of black men? Wow. Here's a book I want to recommend. The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Once again, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. But, but let me drop just a tidbit of history. Some of y'all don't know the origins of the police. There was a whole lot of enslaved people who would run away. They had to create a law called the Fugitive Slave Law, 1850. 
but you had a whole lot who did who who were not willing to accept enslavement so they ran away so they quit so they created slave catchers slave catchers that's the origin of the police force that's not my conspiracy theory i'm just giving you some history that might not be in your curriculum that's the origins of the police the slave catchers the catch runaway i hate to use the word slave i like enslaved better but the the catch runaway enslaved black people and to send them back to their owner even if they escaped up north fugitive slave law said in 1850 if they escaped up north and you catch them they can be returned because they were not considered human beings they were considered property you can't forget that i want to say it again because they were not considered human beings they were considered property so when you try when you're scratching your head trying to understand this adversarial relationship between the police contemporarily and so much of the black community you got to do your history and understand that was always a bad relationship it goes back to the origins of the police force let me keep going number number 49 got two more what do I know about contemporary issues of racial and social justice in the black community, right? What do I know about contemporary issues? And then for number 50, I'm going to flip it, right? I'm going to flip it. Watch this. What do I know about the infinite number of examples of black excellence that has existed since the arrival of the first Africans to America as indentured servants? and subsequently throughout the period of enslavement through the present. Here's what I mean. I'm ending it on a positive note. It's so much pain. It's so much trial and tribulation. It's so much oppression, brutality, discrimination, prejudice, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But through all that, starting with when, the, when, when Black folks first got here, through all that, black excellence always, y'all gotta hear me. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta drag that word out too. Always, black excellence always emerged. See, that's and and, and that's the incredible thing about black people that despite the most heinous oppression known to man in America. And I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't get into the comparison thing, but when you talk about 1619 to 1865 of enslavement, and you talk about the, see, see, when you, when you look at slavery in different parts of the world, because slavery's existed since the beginning of time, but what distinguishes American slavery is this process of dehumanization. I mean, even if you look at the Caribbean. In a lot of places in the Caribbean, the enslaved were able to maintain their culture. It was sustained. Here in America, that was wiped out. So, so you got people who were clueless about the past. So, so, so the culture being within the spirit of the people, it still would emerge. But in terms of the, the, the intentionality of sustaining culture, it's pretty, it was pretty much wiped out, but because it was with, within the spirit of the people, it's still manifest. Regardless of trying to suppress it, it still came out. I hope that makes sense to you. You see, it was in the soul, in the spirit, in the veins of the people. So despite to try to uh, remove it from the psyche, the spirit kept it intact. So you got that situation, and through all of that, black people still manifesting excellence, excellence, excellence throughout the centuries. And if they didn't, I wouldn't be here to tell you the story today. I'm a survivor of that. I'm a survivor of a resilient people. I have a duty to tell what I know. I have a duty to tell what I've studied, to tell what I've learned. I have a duty 
to go against the grain. And when I say I have a duty, I'm just leading by example, y'all, because when I say I have a duty, I'm telling you, you have a duty. I'm not talking to just the folks on here who happen to be African-American. I'm talking about everybody that's on this call and everyone who will see this video later. I'm saying to you, it is very easy. I want you to hear me. I'm going to repeat myself and then I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to give you that I'm gonna give you that my parting words and then we're going to I'm going to let you guys go. I said it about a half hour ago. I challenge anybody in my business who's in this consulting business. If 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 some of your audience happens to be black or so, or, or the students of your of some of your audience or your audience happen to be black. I'm talking to every consultant out there. I don't care whose toes I step on. It don't matter to me. I'm saying to them, I'm asking the question, is somewhere within your workshops, are you being culturally relevant? Are you being culturally responsive? Or are you shying away from that because you're concerned that it may adversely impact your business, your bottom line, your money, right? Because see, me personally, I can't respect that. And I can't respect that individual if you can't take on these topics because you're scared it's going to hurt your business. So what you telling me, you a businessman or are you a, a businessman or woman or are you an educator? But see, you're going you, 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 you to have to draw the line. And if you're an educator, then educate. Because if there are black children in those schools of those audiences that you meet with, then there's some information that you need to be sharing. And what a beautiful thing if you happen to be white and you in there talking about some black history, you in there talking about some Latino history, right? You in there, you know, historically oppressed minorities and you happen to be white, but you have the audacity to go in there and, and, and deliver the message that I delivered. Then I got nothing but respect for you. But if you decide, well, I'm not qualified because I'm white. Oh, really? But you qualified to talk about everything else? See, no, I I, I want to see you go in there. And, and again, if you in there and, and there's black children in that school and you bring in them soft topics that ain't nobody going to get mad about. Right. And then and, and you make you making all this loot. And you're getting all these, you know, all this all, all this admiration on social media and all that. But 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 you're not bringing no real substance. I can't respect that. You got to have backbone. You got to have spine. I, I, I would like to think that a lot of the clients out here in the world respect Principal Kefele because Principal Kefele got the audacity to bring it real. Right. I would I would like to think that that's why I get invitations, because they know that I'm not going to sugarcoat. They know they know I'm not going to come in and offend, but they know I'm going to come in. And, and say what needs to be said, but I'll say it in a way that I don't offend a district and therefore they have to rebuild because of the destruction that I brought. So in other words, I'm gonna bring my professionalism, I'm gonna bring my people skills, but I'm gonna have the audacity to talk about things that need to be talked about. I respect that. So if there are any presenters that watch that are on here live, or you will see this later, I want you to know, I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm a student of the speaking industry. I, I, I watch speakers. I do that for a living. I, if I was a basketball player, you think I wouldn't study the league? If I'm a football player, you think I'm not going to study the league? I'm just going to look at my game? No, I'm looking at all the opponent's games. So as a speaker, I'm looking at all the speakers out here. I want to know what you're talking about. I want to know if you're bringing substance to this thing or you just bringing the soft topics. See, I, I, I want to know. I want to know that you in there and you, 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 you really in this thing. Like you, like you got spine, man. You can stand up straight, your chest out, shoulders back, head up. Yeah, I got. We, we got to talk about some heavy duty stuff here, right? That's that's what I want to see because it is. It's cliche, but the truth will set them youngsters free. The truth will set those those educators in that audience free. You in there talking about some okey doke soft stuff, man? Come on, man! At some point, you got to bring some 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 real truth to that message, because the youngsters—I'm talking about these black youngsters right now. 
They suffering and, and struggling in a whole lot of schools because ain't nobody bringing them no truth. So now they talking about they want to be a rapper. They want to be a basketball player. They want to be a football player. But I want to hear him say, I want to be a scientist. Now, I know that there's many out there who do, but I'm talking about the masses. I ain't talking about individual breakthroughs. But when, but when they're exposed to their truth, when they're exposed to Katherine Johnson, when they're exposed to Granville T. Woods, when they're exposed to Andrew Beard and Jan Matzaliger and so on and so forth, now it's like, and, 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 and Lewis Latimer, right? And now it's like, oh, oh, wait a minute. I'm a descendant of that story? I thought I was a descendant of, of, of Jay-Z. Well, you are. I mean, but, but it's more to us than the rapper. It's more to us than the football player. It's more to us than the basketball player. So I'm saying to you, I'm going to end it on this note. Hey, 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 my colleagues out there to do this work. If you're not out here articulating this truth, I'm calling you out this morning. That's what I'm doing. I'm 60 years old now. I ain't, I'm not that young cat back when I was in my 30s doing this work and in my 40s doing this work and in my in, in my 50s doing this work. I'm in that elder category now. I got certain authority now to call people out. And I'm saying to you, things have to change. And you got to have the audacity to go in there, to talk to that client and say to the client, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm give you my soft stuff, right? I mean, and I know that's not how you're gonna articulate it, but let's get into some real substance too. Let's make sure that, that you, cause you got black students who are at the lowest, at, 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 at the most extreme end of the achievement gap in every state in America. Did you hear me? Black children who are at the, at the most extreme end end of the achievement gap and, and we in there with some soft topic you know i'm not even gonna call out none of the topics but we're gonna spend eight hours on this and you got black children in there at the extreme end of the achievement gap and this is this is this has been since the beginning and they are born brilliant they are born most highly capable they are born with the capacity to achieve anything in life and you going in there with some soft topic so you could come out of there with a bag of money come on man i'm calling you out i'm saying to you you got to go in there and speak some truth that's going to get to them young people so you got to train the teacher to be able to go in there and do what you taught that teacher has to have understanding of his or her role. Like, 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 like you got you, you got youngsters in a school with, with a sign on the wall that says rules. Just that alone, you should be going to the teacher saying, I mean, to the principal when you had a meeting with the principal, hey, hey, principal, tell your teachers to rip them rule signs down. Rip them down. That's part of the problem. Rip them consequences signs down. That's part of the problem. How I'm going to come into a school that was built for me. I'm a child. I'm going to come into a school that was built for me. And as soon as I walk in, you talking me talking to me about some rules. So if I break your rule, things going to happen to me, right? It's going to be consequences. You're going to throw me out. You're going to suspend me. You're going to detain me. You're going to call my mother. You ain't got no rule problem. I know I said ain't got. I'm making emphasis. You, you don't have a rules problem. You don't have a consequences problem. You got a culture problem, right? So now instead of folks, so, so don't go in there giving some six hour presentation or no classroom management. That's not the problem with no black child that's on the wrong end of the achievement gap. Classroom management. That's not the issue. It's, that's, that's, that's just a nice little supplement. The issue is deeper than that. It's ancestral deep. So I'm saying to you, you got to examine the culture of the, of the classroom, starting with the leadership of the building. You got to examine the culture of the classroom, starting with the teacher in the classroom. 
You don't need no rules. Hey, when you come in here, make sure you don't talk. Don't open your mouth. Don't have any gum, right? Don't sit, make sure the rows are straight. Never speak out before you raise your hand. Come on, man. That's 1930 stuff. This is 19, this is 2021. I'm saying to you, it's about the environment. It's about the culture of that classroom where students just adhere to expectations. Students just adhere to norms and values, right? Of that classroom, not, 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 and standards of that classroom, not some rules. When you get to school Monday, for those of you who are back, rip them daggone signs off your wall, rules. Probably got big, bold, black letters, rules. But another sign, big, bold, black letters, consequences with this whole list, this whole chart of what's going to happen to you. And now and now I'm the student. I'm supposed to be excited about that. I'm supposed to be inspired. I can't wait to get back to school tomorrow for some more rules. Are you kidding me? No. They must be exposed to their story. I will stand on that until the day I die. They must be exposed to their story. They must be introduced to who that is in their mirror. That's what they need. You got youngsters walking around right now who have no clue. I mean, today we spent our time in the 50s and the 60s. You have youngsters walking around who do, had no clue as to anything I said today. But here's the problem. We have teachers. Hear me, somebody. I ain't stepping on no toes. I'm just speaking truth. There are teachers who are sitting in classrooms, didn't know absolutely nothing about anything I said today. It would be brand news, brand new. And in fact, with some of them, they would receive it as insulting. And this has no place in the school. There are people in schools that do not know that entire districts like Prince Edward County, and I ain't calling y'all out Prince Edward today. I'm, I'm talking about historically in case they get mad. I don't like how you went on that film and talked about it. 1959, that's what you did. 1959 and 1964, you shut that entire district down so that black children could not be educated in it. That's the, that's the history. We ain't running away from that. But does the teacher know that? See, does the teacher know that? See, we got to be exposed, right? So, so, so we got to undo, unravel some of what we think we know, and we got to remold it. But to my colleagues out there, this is my last time. I need y'all to be on board. I know it's many that are. You know, somebody just um, posted uh, Zaretta Hammond's name. I know, I know, I know. It's it's a lot of people who are, but it's a lot of people. They 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 throwing little lobs, right? You know what a lob is? Like you take a picture. Just throw a little lob and, and the batter will just knock that out the park every time. No, you no, no, stop throwing them lobs. Throw a fastball. 95 miles an hour. Right. Go in there with a backbone. Go in there with a spine. But then those of you who are on this call and those of you who will see this video, I'm telling you the same thing. I've been posting a book a day for the entire February. Black History Month. I hope you guys been checking it out. And if you haven't, just scroll my my social media, Facebook and Twitter, and check out these books I've been posting. Right then, I've been posting a book a week since May for educators of Black children, and I'm gonna continue to do that starting next Sunday. I'll get back to those books, but you gotta buy them. You gotta read them. You gotta examine them. Right? You got you, you gotta have that. You, you, you gotta have that knowledge base. It's like like Piaget was cool, you know, long time ago. <laughs> but 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 now it's some other folks that you need to be reading. Right. You need to be reading some Dr. Uh, Gloria Ladson Billings. You need to be reading some Dr. Geneva Gay. Some Dr. Lisa Del Pitt. Right. Some Dr. Chris Emden. Right. See, we got we 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 we, we got some contemporary people who are breaking this stuff down. Some Dr. Anthony Muhammad. Right. You, you see, you, 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 you got to delve into their work. We got some contemporary people who are doing this research. Dr. Donna Ford, right? I can and I can go all day, right? We got some contemporary scholars who are doing this work, right? This but where's this book at? We got like like I showed you this one time. Dr. Alfred Tatum, reading for their life. 
right? I mean, it's 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 so much, but you got you you got to jump into it if you want to know what to read. Go to Principal Cafele Writes. Scroll way down because I got a lot of stuff on there. Read all that stuff, but I gotta scroll way down to my suggested reading list. I, I got you covered. I'm not gonna just tell you to read and not tell you what the titles are. Just go all just just go to my 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 blog page, Principal Cafele Writes, or go to principalcafele.com and click the blog page. Just you can get it from my website. And then scroll way down because I got like about about 70, 70 articles on there. And you will see Dr. Jawanza Kunjufu. Thank you. How could I forget? I don't know if there'd be me in this space that I'm in without him. All this is Kunjufu. <laughs> and it's just some of it. He wrote like 50 books. All this. See. I'm saying to you, so go to the website, scroll back, and check it out. Check it out. Hey, y'all, listen, I'm done. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you stuck around. I, it, I, I hope I didn't offend anybody, but I, I hope I didn't offend anybody, but I do hope I made some people feel uncomfortable. Because if I didn't, I didn't do my work. If you go to my website, principalcafele.com, the, the first thing you're going to see, it says America's Discomfort Speaker. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not in this to motivate nobody. That's not what I do. I mean, I know how to do it and I, I weave it in. You know, when we open up at 11 o'clock, that, that was like two hours ago, right? When I open up, but once I get into it, I'm not, I, I don't do this to like make people feel good. I'm no motivator. I'm America's discomfort speaker. See, motivation doesn't last too long. You could go to a conference. I'd be at a conference. They give me a standing ovation. Oh my God, Kafele! Right? But now, once they get to the car, they ain't thinking about me no more. Life resumed. But watch this. If I could say something in that message, and it, it's like, like a beast thing. Ouch. Ow. So now let's say throughout the message, I'm, the, I'm just stinging somebody. Ouch. 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 Ooh. They ain't going to forget that message. They ain't gonna forget that. Somebody might be, might be listening to me right now and was saying ouch throughout, but you decided to stay on, but you mad at me now? And you, I ain't watching this guy no more. Okay, fine, but guess what? You ain't gonna forget me either. See, see, because ouch lasts for a long time. Ouch lasts for a long time, man. See, see, my man, I got my, one of my guys here in Jersey named DeLacy Davis. He's on here sometime. He used to say back in the day, I don't know if he say it now, but he used to say back in the day, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to speak my truth. He said, you may not invite me back, but you ain't going to forget I was here. <laughs> see, and that's that's what the discomfort is all about. See, see, not to make people angry, but to get people thinking, to get people to look within themselves, to look inside. Right. So that's why you got to invest in this, like get you a little pocket one. Right. That you could bring it with you. And then as you move about your day, your life, you like bring your mirror. I need to I need to do some self-reflection on on that. See, that's all I'm saying. y'all. Hey, y'all, listen here. Homework. Same question as last week. What measures will I take to enhance my knowledge of African-American history? What measures will I take? What am I reading? What will I read? And it doesn't have to be a book. It could be journals. It could be articles on the web. You know, we it's, 20, it's 21st century. It's a whole lot on the internet now. Next week, here's my topic. See, folks going to love this. They're going to they gonna love me next week. Preparation for the principal interview. Let's break it down. I'm going to show you how to walk into that interview when that person says you're hired. That's what next week is. It'd be a little different from this week. <laughs> Preparation for the principal interview. Let's break it down. Prepare to be with me for over an hour because I'm going to give it all to you. Someone said to me, why you be giving all this stuff for free? I hear that all the time. Like, like you, you, you giving 55 weeks of free content. But here's the thing. I've never given you guys anything that the clients pay for. I've never had. I just got a wealth of information up here. I never gave you anything that they pay for. That's number one. But number two, and this is probably more important, to whom much is given, 
Much is required. What I look like holding my information and the only time I give it up is when somebody gives me a dollar. What I look like. How God going to view me when it's time for me to come face to face. See, see, don't on that day. I want him to look at me and say. You gave my people something when you didn't have to. And you got nothing in exchange. I thank you, my servant. See, that's that's who I want to be. So I'm going to get I'm going if it takes me three hours next weekend, if I'm the only one on this call, I'm going to show you how to get that job. I'll be working all week preparing my notes. I'm going to show you how to get that job. It's called, again, preparation for the principal interview. Let's break it down. Y'all tell somebody out there <laughs> I'm going to be don't don't rely on watching that video on YouTube. You got to get the real time energy on that one. Um, I'm almost done, y'all. Don't forget. Got to push these. Assistant Principal 50, aspiring Principal 50. Get it right now if you don't have it. Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, uh, principalcafele.com, ASCD.org. Make sure you subscribe to Virtual AP Leadership Academy on YouTube. Make sure that you like and follow Virtual Leadership Academy at Virtual AP Leadership Academy on Facebook. Wear your mask, stay six feet apart, keep your hands washed, and that's your personal decision on that vaccine. I ain't got no say in it. I will say this, though. I'm going to take it. I'll say that. What you do is on you. I'm taking it. I don't know when. I don't feel like I need it right now because I ain't around nobody. <laughs> hey, y'all, I appreciate you. Have, appreciate you. Have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up. Cock that fist way back because you got to give it some thunder. Count to three. One, two, three. Bam! See you guys next week at 11 o'clock Eastern Time, 10 o'clock Central, 9 Mountain, and 8 Pacific. And then Alaska people, whatever that time is, I see you then.